Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, the plan for today is on one side, complete some of the introductory material that we left in the first lecture that are these sort of fundamentals just to get everybody on the same page and, and then continue with some perspective on human AI interaction. Mm. So we, starting from the panel that we had last time, we are going to go a little bit deeper into the automation versus augmentation and the uh, evolution of that tension between one and the other because now because that was a uh, 50 60 years old uh, um, tension between okay it's better automation is better uh, augmentation towards one versus the other but now they are moving to uh, a compromise can we say something that is not so one or the other and we will see other perspective on this and the current state uh, of the things and in doing that we also need to have a little bit of historical perspective. So I'm not going to tell you the history, but we will get some sentences, some statement from people in the 1960, 1950s, so that we, we start from there also for getting better understanding why we started to have this automation versus augmentation or autonomy versus human control in the first place. But before going there, uh, a few fundamentals. Some of these fundamentals will be extended in the next lecture. Mm? So now we are in the third lecture of seven, so we are almost at the half of the course. Next time I will not be here. Uh, Alberto will come here to have the next lecture with you. And some of the fundamental will also be extended the next time, but just a little bit to give you some model and some more operative ways to, to proceed in designing and then developing and deploying human AI system or human-centered AI system, as we are going to call it. So these are still part of the introductory slide that we had two times ago. Mm? But uh, we had uh, this uh, Harry Lieberman in uh, 29, 20, 29, uh, writing in this uh, artificial intelligence magazine. So uh, a publication, yet a magazine, for artificial intelligence. And uh, this person was reflecting on the fact that actually these two fields that now we are going to, in this course, we are going to, to follow and to build on, that is human-computer interaction and artificial intelligence, actually since the beginning mm, of computing, they have been intertwined. Mm. Both are subfield of computer science, start as subfield of computer science, but they always had some kind of love hate relationship. Mm. So also this tension between augmentation and automation was a love hate relationship because uh, AI people say, no, it's better to automate. And HCI people say, no, it's better to augment. And each one has their own arguments towards this uh, statement. Mm. So there is always this kind of tension. But uh, uh, Lieberman says, so actually, both communities could be very, very useful if they start working together, start focusing on creating user interfaces, whatever they are user interfaces, not just a graphical user interface. Also, human-robot interaction, that is, again, the robot as an interface for the human, or vocal user interface, mm? so conversational user interface, natural language processing for interfacing with a computer. So if they start working together, they will probably make user interface a little less stupid and frustrating that are today mm? and mm? I, I think that all of you have at some point experience with a user interface probably graphical that and that you watch it and say why what I can do now why it's done this way 
is not helping me. So just to make an example, like this for the microphone, this microphone is not working in the room, but here the user interface say, you can go, it's everything fine, then clearly it's not. Hmm? And, and maybe, I, I don't want to say that maybe a little bit of AI will, will help, but again, there is, if we think about the role of understanding, here there is no understanding why this thing is not working for the room, but instead is working for recording. So the signal arrives, but not go in, into the room. Hmm? So if two fields learn to speak together and they can create actually better, can benefit both when they are in revol uh, facing towards human, towards people. Hmm? So that was the starting point. So just remember that these are fundamentals in the introductory slides. So we are still for the one moment in this introductory moment uh, so we, we need to have this kind of conversation with um, AI and HCI people hmm, together to understand how to build better uh, AI system. And since most of you uh, work in some kind of efforts in AI, uh, probably not all of you know about human-computer interaction. How many of you, I know that for sure one of you knows a lot about human-computer interaction, or knows about human-computer interaction, but how many of you know what is this? Okay. Um, well, three out of all of you here. Mm? So, just to give you a brief, again, then there are courses at Polytechnico if you want to expand on this, but just to give you a very, very brief five minutes overview of human-computer interaction. Human-computer interaction is, as written here, a multidisciplinary field. So it starts and it's typically intended as a subset of computing because there is human-computer interaction. Um, but it has many, many phases in it. So there are psychology, there are sociology, there are industrial design, there are lawyers from some aspects, hmm? ethics of using computer. So it's, it's a multidisciplinary field that does a, a lot of things. And just to give you some ideas also from, let's say, a research perspective, the biggest uh, community, the biggest organization that support human-computer interaction, the study human-computer interaction is called SICAI, hmm? that is part of ACM. So do you know what is ACM? Do you know what is IEEE? Okay, so IEEE um, is similar to SEM. So IEEE is very, very big, do a lot of things in the area of engineering, also has all part about standardization, mm, stand like the Wi-Fi is a standard, is an IEEE standard, but it also has all the parts about conferences, journals, uh, the society, so there is a computer society, the mm, electronic society, or whatever it's called, etc. So SEM is similar to uh, IEEE in the part not related to standardization. Mm? So SEM doesn't have anything about standardization and is just for scientific uh, research and practitioner. And it is a scientific community like IEEE, but it's just focusing on computing. Mm? Whatever it is, computing, it could be software engineering, it could be uh, computer architecture, it could, be, it could be computer graphics, it could be human-computer interaction, it could be artificial intelligence. Mm? And SEM is structured in this SIG, that are special interest group, mm? and that are independent groups that explore one area of this computing field. So there is SIG AI, that is a special interest group focusing on AI, and there is the SIGSoft, that is the special interest group on software engineering. Uh, etc. And among the SIGGRAPH about computer graphics, and among these SIGs, uh, there is also SIGKAI, hmm, that is the special interest group on computer human interaction. And all these SIGs are then organized conferences. So SIGKAI is the, the SIG for human computer interaction, the largest one that we have internationally. There are also other clearly organizations outside the CM that works on human computer interaction on different perspective. But give a is one of the biggest one, numerically, uh, internationally, clearly, 
and it has a lot of conferences this just give you an idea of the many things that fall under the umbrella of human computer interaction mm? so there is for instance a conference that is called the human robot interaction that is focused on specifically interacting with robots and humans and then there is intelligent user interface mm, that is more similar to what we are going to do here in this course that is connected with intelligence uh, artificial intelligence applied to user interface and then um, there is computer supported collaborative work automotive user interface and so you see different things that fall together designing interactive system that are more uh, similar that more towards designing industrial design architecture etc mm? so a lot of more contribution on that and then there is a general conference that is uh, bigger that's called CHI mm, that's written like key in Italian so C-H-I uh, but it's pronounced CHI that just is the generalistic conference for all of this so there are actually various facets on this so it's a multidisciplinary field in that sense and as the goal in general you can see clearly this on different perspective but it's concerned with the design evaluation and implementation on interactive computing system for human use mm? and not only that but also studying the phenomena surrounding the study so also understanding how people use some pieces of a technology or how people will use mm? which are the needs which are the problem that people may have in interacting with current technology or which are the needs for which we can create better user interface better technology and that could be more technical or less technical so this could be interview surveys focus group and things to understand or it could be let's develop a prototype let's build a system it could be a software system it could be an hardware system mm, also some aspects more technical in different in different aspects mm. but overall it's concerned with the design evaluation implementation of computing system that are interactive and interactive with people mm? and clearly as the name say involves two entities people humans and computers mm? uh, that determine each other behavior over time mm? and this behavior over time is what is called interaction in the title and interaction is always framed in terms of human's goal and the related task or pursuit so it's not the fact that I am in front of a computer and we are interacting like in this nice way to see but is how the computer support hmm, uh, my behavior and how I change the computer behavior in terms of my goals what they want to do now hmm, in this moment and my related task and pursuit mm. so now I'm presenting this so I'm using PowerPoint I'm using some kind the computer to perform some kind of activities when I'm not presenting my user another mm, I have another task another pursuit another goal I will have other kind of needs and uh, the computer and I will have different behaviors to, so, to fulfill hopefully well those needs so this is in general as uh, a field also from a, a research perspective and um, I have two questions for you just to wake up everybody do you know what are these two things in the picture these are traditionally framed as contribution major contribution from human computer interaction I, in a in a moment in which there is not strict difference between the various sub-discipline of computing but uh, they are traditionally associated with human computer interaction the first is yes the mouse created by Engelbart so this is the prototype of the mouse the, s the same mouse uh, well that you are not using now because you have a a laptop but that you, you probably use and you have used since ages so this is one thing that stem from human computer interaction because it was something that 
uh, helped people to interact, to fulfill their goal better with a computer. Hmm? And if you happen to be, uh, if, you, if you go in the future in, in California, in Mountain View, uh, there is the Computer History Museum where there is mm, this prototype, the, the real prototype of the mouse uh, in, the, in the computer, in the museum. So you can also, you cannot touch it, but you can, you can see it uh, if you want. And the same logic, the same mechanism of the current mouse, clearly now it's optical and it's more refined, but the basic idea is, is that one is there, it started there. Mm? And from that prototype to the first mouse, commercially available mouse was, uh, I think that passed like 30 years mm, before that prototype and the first commercially available mouse on the market. Mm. So that was the research at that time. Mm. Uh, in a time where you just have a key keyboard to interact with a computer, to, to insert information on a computer, and a screen to read information from a computer. Mm. Um, and if you never have heard about mouse and Engelbart, um, have a look at, at the, the story, there is also some videos on YouTube, because uh, Engelbart, and this is not related strictly for, to the course or HCI, Engelbart did a demo, a demonstration of the mouse and other system that he were presenting in a conference, and that demo is still today called the mother of all demos, mm? because it as a lot of positive and good attributes on how a demo could, should work. Mm? So any kind of technology-related demo could be uh, inspired or take some positive attributes from properties from that, how that demo is structured and conducted. And in that demo, the Hengelbart doesn't e show only the mouse, but other, also other things mm? um, that uh, and that's it. And the second one, the second one is harder, I know. A keyboard, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is the keyboard for sure, but there is something. What, what do you, what came to your mind? seeing one things like this nowadays. What could be a cousin of this, a parent of this, a relative of this, 50 years after, 60 years out, 60 years after? A tablet, yes. So this was clearly not a tablet, but it was uh, an idea that then bring, also inspired probably, the creation of a tablet. And this was a prototype, uh, it's called the, the Dynabook, hmm? and was a prototype created, uh, also created physically, this is a drawing clearly, by Alan Kay at the Xerox Park uh, in the US, um, that imagine uh, a tool that a computer that you can bring with you um, as a stylus, as file, you can draw on it, you can do some of the things that you are doing now with tablets. Mm? And Alan Kay, just to put you in context, was one of the person, or better, is the person, who invented the definition, at least, of um, object-oriented programming, just to, to give you an idea. Mm? And he was interested in how computer can be useful for learning, for computing education, for children to experiment to play with technology with computers. So this was, in, her, in his opinion, uh, a way to, to reach this goal, mm? to have something for, also for children, to, to program, to create things with a computer. Mm? So this is yet another things that typically is associated with human-computer interaction on a research perspective. Mm? Then it didn't become um, a product until until the tablets, mm, but they are not strictly related. So different from the mouse, that actually is the same thing, just move from research to, um, to, to production, this was more an inspiration of things that eventually can recall the current tab ta tablets. Mm. Just to give you a, a picture of this. And 
the main point that I would like to, to focus here about human-computer interaction is that the perspective, the focus in human-computer interaction is fundamentally different from other fields. Mm? So in other fields, typically, the technology is the end. We are going to do something to improve technology, mm? to make the algorithm 3% faster, better, more precise, whatever. Mm? We're going to build the next generation robots, the more precise vehicle. So technology is the end. Uh, in human-computer interaction, the end, as you can imagine, is not technology. Uh, technology is a mean to reach that end. So it's not the final object, but is something that you can use to reach your end and will probably, hopefully, simplify, help you in reaching that end. And, but the end is satisfying users' needs, attitude and expectation. So people mm, is, is the, the, the one of the main uh, design pattern for human-computer interaction is the user-centered design, but they, they already give you this idea that people is first at the center. Mm. So in human-computer interaction, we don't start from technology, we start from people. And uh, yes, there will be technology. I'm a bit there will be smart technology, intelligent technology, cool technology, whatever you want. But the beginning, first and foremost, is people, and then people is involved in all, should be involved in all the steps of the process. Not just at the beginning, not just at the end, and uh, as an afterthought. Oh, I did this, and now how can we use it with people? The approach is totally different. What people need, and what we can build if there is something that we can build to satisfy those needs, to satisfy those, those goals. And then we can also evaluate this with people, just to see if there is a good match between what they need, with their expectation, their course with their goal, and what we build. Mm. So this is a, a different perspective. Technology is still here, is still there. Mm. Like I in the mouse, or in this kind of tablets, in the Dynabook. Technology is here, is there, is probably the most visible artifacts. But the question is not how we can build something different for interacting with a computer. The starting point, that is the mouse, but the starting point was how we can, in the case of Engelbart, how we can augment the human intellect with technology. And Engelbart and his team came up with a series of things, including the mouse. But the goal was how we can augment, how we can help knowledge worker to work better, and to collaborate remotely when the internet w didn't exist. Mm. How we can have people working together, technology supporting people in their knowledge work. Mm. So the starting point and the end point is always people. And technology is just a way to fulfill those needs. Mm. So this is characteristics especially of human-computer interaction. Mm? So people uh, at the center, mm, meaning that is actually the starting point, the ending point, and involved in the process, not just after or, oh yes, uh, I've done a market inquiry and I discovered this and then I will build something that is what I had in mind. Mm? But people, th the users of that specific, the one, the person that will be the user of the specific piece of technology will need to be at the center. Mm? And which are the key concept? Mm? We, we are not going to see everything clearly, but the key concept of human-computer interaction. Mm? So I, I try to summarize these uh, seven points here. So we have some key attributes. Mm, I told you in the first lecture that we typically would like to have a system that is used, usable, and useful. Mm, well, all, all the three together. Not just usable and useless or and not used, 
but not even widely used, totally useless and totally usable, uh, not usable, and not even totally useful, but hard to use and not usable at all and not used at all. And so we would like to have all the three things together, usable, used, and useful. Mm? Because in this way, you have something that is highly useful, that is widely used, so it has an impact and is also useful, usable, so it's easy to use mm? and better fulfill the, the idea, mm? the goals, the, tar the, the opinion, the, the poor suites, the needs of the person that is using the system, all the, person, the people that are using the system. Mm? So these three elements, mm? so on, on the used part, we cannot really do something particular, we can work for sure on the usefulness and usability, hoping that both will bring to a wider use of the system, of the things that we are developing. We cannot control how people use, whether people use or not something. But for sure we can instead focus on the usefulness. So to accomplish something that is required, expected, that answer to a specific need of the people, and usability, mm, that here is summarize it, do it easily, don't let me think. Mm. So in general, when you see a user interface and you don't know what to do and you need to think, I need to press here to press there, I need to move this or to move there, there is a usability problem most of the time. Mm. Because you have to stop and say, okay, to accomplish what I need, what I need to do. It's not immediate, it's not well, com well done, it's not well communicated to the person that is using the system. It's not easy to reach a very good usability, mm? but it's possible to move in the right direction. Mm? The other key attributes in human-computer interaction are for sure performance, uh, robustness, mm? that are connected with usability also. Uh, because if something is not robust, if something is, is, is going to break every five minutes, stop working every five minutes, it creates frustration to the people that are using the system, the interface, and they will stop using or they complain. And again, it's not something that is useful for fulfilling their own goal, their own needs, because it, it stops working every three minutes. So the robustness and the performance is still important. If I need to do an operation and it takes five minutes to move a file from one folder to another, I it's a problem hmm? for, for that kind of simple operation. If every type you type on a word processor and you type a letter and this letter appear on the screen five minutes later, it's not acceptable for the task at hand. So there is a problem performance. Hmm? It's not a problem of usability per se because it's easy, you have to press a key and then the key, the letter appears, but there is a very long delay that is not acceptable hmm, for that kind of operation. A and then there is also mm, a part that is about attractiveness and engagement. Hmm, so how things appear hmm, and if it's engaging or not, and there are various strategies, mm, criticize or, or, or less, to create more engagement. So think about, uh, for instance, gamification. Gamification could be a strategy to create more engagement in some domains. Hmm? Or likes, comments on social media that are there to create number of views that are there to create more engagement hmm? uh, with positive and negative effects. And so these are more or less the key attributes on any, in general, uh, interactive system. Usefulness, usability, hopefully, the fact that the, the system will be used and then the right performance, the right robustness for the task at hand and attractivity, attractiveness and engagement to continue probably to use the system. Mm? Uh, and these are key attributes in general. And then uh, there are things more related about studying people, understanding people. Uh, that, it, that are as main concept these this three. So first of all is understanding people and their needs. And it's something that I is taken from 
uh, more from the empirical part of research or from also psychology. S and, and some of these you also have in software engineering, for instance, for the empirical methods in software engineering. So understanding people, understanding how a system works, understanding which are the problems with the system, hmm, or people using that system. Hmm. So understanding people and their needs, with or without technology. Hmm. Uh, maybe you want to understand which are the issues that an AI developer has in creating a classification model so that you can do something to ease that process, hmm? intelligently or not, where the intelligence is just in the person, in computer, is shared. It could be various things, but that is something after. This is the design of the system. But the need could be, I need help in doing a specific task in this process that is not supported. So you can focus, if you want, on that kind of need, on that kind of aspect. And this needs to be un to understand people, to understand the AI developer in doing something very, very specific. Uh, and then there is also analyzing the behavior. So just you collect data, and then you need to analyze this, this information. There could be quantitative information, so you can use statistical methods. But it could also be qualitative information, hmm? so for, for which you need more um, qualitative kind of more uh, other kind of analysis not statistical analysis because you don't have numbers you have sentences you have opinions hmm? uh, is it clear the difference between quantitative and qualitative yes okay and and then also uh, and this could be at the beginning or in, in during but also at the end you also need to understand how the solution you designed affect people perception attitude and judgment mm. and if it works well if the answer as i said before the need and and what you are have understood from people mm. uh, because sometimes adding technology in a specific domain will change something in the attitude of people just for the fact of having added that piece of technology Maybe they discover something more that they didn't think before. They had new needs hmm, that the addition of this system will have, will have brought to. And, and again, in human with interaction, but also here, we would like to focus on this human-centered approach. Hmm? So putting people at the center of everything we do, everything we build. Mm? And again, it could be at the beginning, early focus on people and their task, their needs, their pursuit, their expectation. Mm? Observing people, speaking with people, doing the things that they want to do. Again, if we want to improve, support AI designers to do to create uh, a more sim in a sim more simpler way, a simpler way, uh, a classification system. We need to speak with AI designer. We need to observe how they build now a model to understand which tricks are they using, to understand uh, which pros they have, which cons current way of proceeding as, mm -hmm. uh, and then also hopefully involving them in the design process. So I in HCI is, is typically to have iterative design. Mm -hmm. So doing things and then editing those things and then throw it away a little bit and then redo another step of things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's typical to have this prototype based iterative approach. So we you build the first prototype and then you evaluate this first prototype and then you change this prototype and then you build another maybe more sophisticated prototype and then you change a little bit that after seeing how it works with people, with your people, the people that you are interested in supporting, and then doing a third prototype. And maybe the first prototype is just paper. It's just a user interface drawn on paper. And maybe the second prototype is not on paper, it's on, on Photoshop or similar things. So on a computer. And then your third prototype is something more interactive, so in code. And then your fourth prototype will be something closer 
to the final results that you have. Hmm? So this is what HCI do in Adam research and also in practice hmm, in companies when they need to build a, a user interface, whatever it is, again, not necessarily a visual user interface, a graphical user interface, but also other kind of user interface. So early focus on people in task, iterative design, hmm, just to fix things, to work towards usability, and also user-based evaluation. Hmm? So you can use simulators, prototypes, scenarios, use case, all these kind of things to get information, to get feedback on how to proceed. And the benefit, clearly you have more work than not just saying, okay, I'm going to do this, and I will do this in one month. You have more work, you have a longer process, that is the drawback of this, but you also have many benefits, hmm? safety, ethics, innovation sometimes, hmm? uh, because you, you are not your, we are not our user, the user of the system that we develop. So when we develop something, when we design something, we design with our own assumption in mind, implicit or explicit that they are. We are building that with our bias, what we think is good for them. But then if them are really different from us, and typically they are, our expectations are not met. Hmm? So if I'm going to de design something with, uh, for, for nurses, in a hospital, hmm? I can imagine how a nurse work, which are the needs in an hospital. But is this the accurate, the real picture of how a nurse work, which are the needs of the nurses? Probably not. Hmm? So I probably need to speak with nurses, to understand, ob to observe nurses in their daily routine, in the shift, and understand if there is a problem, and where is a problem where we can simplify life or not. Maybe we think that the problem is the shift, mm, the management of shift, and then we discovered that no, absolutely not. That the problem is inventory or passing knowledge between one nurse and the other or communication with the doctors, who knows? So it's not that our first idea is, is the right one. Mm. So, and this again is, is connected to this, the technology as a mean to an end, not just for the sake of creating and fulfilling our idea. The fact that we can do something doesn't mean that we should. Hmm? This in general, not only related to, um, to AI, hmm? clearly. And so this would like to be the, 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 the umbrella about the brief um, overview on, on HCI. Um, you, you are going to see another things that is uh, models um, because to to understand um, to create something that is useful and usable and then ultimately used you need to understand that people has a certain model in mind how, how things work and computers have their own models on how things operate Clearly, mm, they are two complex entities. And these two models, the two expectations should met at a certain point. Mm. They should start speaking the same language in a way to understand each other. Mm. So you are going to, to see next time also a little bit of this model, of this gap between the, the mind of the computer and the mind of the person that needs to, to speak together. Uh, but all of this is still, uh, related to HCI. So why are we speaking about human AI and not just uh, human computer interaction in general? Um, right, because I it's already here. There is a human centered approach. There is involving people. So technology is an end. So wha what is different? I, I probably we, we mentioned this in the first lecture, but what is different when AI enters in, in play? And this is a question for you. What change in all of this to you 
So why are we doing a human AI interaction course and not just a human computer interaction course? I, it's already here, human-centered, usability. Technology is an end, so who cares if it's AI or not? There are So you're saying it's a matter of control, who is controlling things. But you can personalize the output even without the eye. And also you can delegate, con you can also have a computer controlling things on their own without using AI, just in a systematic way doing operation on their own without any machine learning model in it, any representation, any knowledge just do things in a programmatic way automatically, right? So automation without speaking about AI exists automation so even without AI. But closer, not there, but closer. There are two things that we probably mentioned. Let me see. We know, eh? AI systems are typically, machine learning systems especially, data-driven AI systems are typically performed under uncertainty and results can be incorrect for what a person is expecting to be. Mm? And we did the example, if I have a classifier and for chairs and this the classifier could be the this this one that you have here on the desk uh, is a chair for 49% and for 51% is not hmm? it's operating under a certainty and could lead to incorrect decision incorrect output hmm? so we clearly know that this is a chair but maybe a machine learning a classifier Say, I, I didn't, I never seen a chair like this before, so to me, it's more similar to another thing than not a chair. So it's maybe a chair for 30%, and for the rest is something else. And this is clearly incorrect for our perspective, because we recognize a chair, and we can say, yes, this is a chair. Hmm? So this is a simple, uh, clearly, uh, uh, example, but yet, if you apply these on different things, you, you can recognize that there is uncertainty, that there are false positive, false negative, and results on a human perspective, on the, on the human that uses that system, can be incorrect. So what change is this one? So like the Tesla that is not recognizing the grass with respect to the street. So what is changing? from human computer interaction and human AI, human-centered AI, is that most of the things we can borrow from human computer interaction, but many, many of the principles of the idea of the guidelines that apply for normal computer system that work with certainty, and those results will be always the same mm, in not a machine learning, not a data-driven approach, mm, like if you do five plus three, you will also get the same result in, with a calculator, right? We, we don't have, in human group interaction in general, this problem, these characteristics. And so many of the guidelines of the principle that are uh, in human computer interaction cannot apply as is or totally to the when AI is in the middle. And we need something slightly different to cope, especially with uncertain and incorrect. Mm? Because sometimes you have AI systems that are intrinsically inconsistent from one execution to the other. And you cannot do anything else that, that accept this inconsistency. Mm? While a normal computer system, not AI-based, is, is typically should be consistent. You can make it consistent in the output, in the results, in the interpretation of information that you have. Mm? In AI, you cannot guarantee this. So if you have like 
exist a guideline, a principle in human computer interaction that say you should strive for consistency in the user interface, well, here that principle will be violated often, very, very often. So that cannot be applied as is. So some of the things we, we will bring, we can bring some of the things from human computer interaction, but other things cannot apply as is. Maybe on 10 principles, we can apply seven, but for three, they, they cannot apply. We, we cannot apply them to an AI system. Mm? So there is some differences. Mm? And so there is why there is also interesting research on this. And there are, and we are going to see, you are going to see with Alberto, uh, for instance, guidelines created specifically for developing human AI system, human-centered AI system keeping in mind various kind of things. And so there are specific guidelines that takes into consideration artificial intelligence that are different from the guidelines that uh, a company can provide to create a graphical user interface, a normal graphical user interface, a traditional graphical user interface. Hmm? And, and we're going to see and apply that um, in, in the use case that we are going to, to do. Don't forget to fill out this about crop composition. If you didn't, deadline should be today. Okay, so what we are speaking about mostly in this course is about human-centered AI. Hmm? So a concept that actually starts very, very, a concept that uh, if you if you remember the pen the, the papers you read um, the one about mixed principle initiative mm -hmm. already some things were there but I it's as a concept per se it's quite recent you see here 2020 mm -hmm. so it's something very very recent as a definition at least formalized as a definition as a set of properties as a set of characteristics and the definition say this, and, and this is a definition by, by this, this person that is Ben Schneiderman, that is one of the, let's say, founding father of human-computer interaction in the United States. Mm. Um, and the definition say that human-centered AI, and while reading this, think about automation versus augmentation, Focus is, which is the goal. The goal is focusing on amplifying, augmenting, and enhancing human performances. Mm. Whatever they are, the human performances, in doing a specific task. But it doesn't stop here. Mm. It's not just augmenting people, like we, we have said in the, um, in the panel. But it go further, in a way that make the AI system reliable, safe, and trustworthy. Mm. So trustworthy, we spoke about um, understandability, the role of understandability last time in the second panel. Trustworthiness is surely linked to that, that concept. But also reliability and safety that are not, mm, if you think about this list of concepts, it's not here, reliability. Mm. It speaks about robustness, performance, but the reliability is not something that appears here. Mm. So we have this mixed goal. We would like to augment people, so that our goal is not automating, but we also want that the AI system that we are using to amplifying, augmenting, or and or enhancing performance is reliable, safe, and trustworthy. Cannot be anything less than reliable, safe, and trustworthy. Mm? And in this human-centered AI, we are going to see in a while some more details, but the main idea is that there is the shift in the proposal uh, of, this, of this framework of human-centered AI is performing a shift in the AI community, for people working with AI especially, a shift to measuring only 
and let me repeat only algorithm performance like happens in a lot of AI related products a lot of AI related papers etc so precision recall etc that kind of metrics so instead of measuring only those mm, also in addition keep in mind human centered keep in mind human performance keep in mind human satisfaction with a system mm, with a human centered and participatory approach again from the beginning for the evaluation in the middle etc so the idea as we mentioned at the beginning of the first lecture is to put people that already are in the process hmm? if you remember we said who is going to collect data people sometimes people are even the source of data because it might be a sensor that monitor people hmm? and then who is going to produce the algorithm to test the algorithm and it, this is always people hmm, in the process so just add more people to to the process mm. um, so that it could be human centered and could be it could reduce also bias could increase trustworthiness etc by just applying just it's figurative clearly but just shifting not only starting thinking, okay, I would like to reach an algorithm that is 3% better in any way than another one, the state of the art, but saying this one and adding, and it should be useful. It should augment people. It should answer to some specific needs of the per people that we have in mind. Hmm? So if we are going to develop a robot, well, that this robot will be maybe for somebody to be used the robot so hmm? or uh, a board will be used for by somebody else if it's something for helping um, CAD designer to create different layout it should be something for that help that support CAD designer not just it works well but nobody is going is able to use it because nobody understand how to use it not even the result just how to use it hmm? so again more people is the message for for these these slides and here Schneider must show in a picture what what means mm? so basically now we have uh, the, the current let's say paradigm is to have algorithms and they are in the center and people maybe at a certain point we will have to deal with people unfortunately and instead I, I, what he's proposing is to apply the same idea that is already present in human computer interaction but with AI specifically with the changes that AI brings that is let's bring a human in the center let's not forget about AI let's not forget about matrix about precision about recalls but just let's focus more in addition to that let's include people in the equation Okay, so this, this would be the, the fundamentals. Any question up to this point? Good, or probably not, I don't know. If you don't have a question, either you are totally annoyed or everything was clear, so or something in the middle, so I don't know if it's good or not. But starting from those fundamental and just remember that they you will go a little bit farther on some of the on another fundamental that is a model uh, in the next lecture. And for, for those of you who already know it will be sort of repetition but again it's put everybody on the same page um, let's speak about a little bit of perspective on human AI interaction hmm? so let's bring why we we reached this human centered AI framework which are the characteristics how can we apply consider it uh, with some example but let's start from the panels uh, so especially the first one hmm? and 
let's say that we are going to do still maybe 15 minutes up an hour of the class and then we will have a break so just let's let me start on these and then we can have a break um, so let's start with this question for what we have set up to now and for your panel let's ask our question can AI and people really work together um, well we, we hope so and we have also positive example of things that work in this way but which will be the characteristics how we can design and develop and deploy system to to have this work together working effectively and traditionally let's say historically a little bit from this perspective we from one side to allow people and technology work together we had this tension between automation and augmentation so also historically uh, the, the question was should we design and develop technology and notice that here speaking about technology doesn't care about algorithms machine learning just technology whatever it is hmm? technology whose goal is to automatize people's action so that is able to replace human and what was one of the first goals of artificial intelligence so that's why it's called artificial intelligence here in those, this paper because one of the first idea behind the creation of artificial intelligence was just this replicate human intelligence so that a machine can do everything that a human can do so substitute human replace human with machines hmm? so even before speaking about machine learning algorithms and, and other things what we called last time automation just to, to avoid problems with artificial intelligence because we can also have artificial intelligence algorithms technology for the second things that is augmenting people mm? what we called intelligent augmentation but in the early days automation was artificial intelligence so creating machine to replace humans and on the other side you have intelligent augmentation so creating machines, creating technology to augment them. Mm. And again, we know now that we can use artificial intelligence system, algorithms, models to either automatize or to augment people. Mm. So when here you see artificial intelligence, so in these slides will be a little mixed because sometimes it's artificial intelligence meaning automation and others in other moments will be artificial intelligence meaning artificial intelligence technology, techniques. So it will be a, a little bit of mix, but when is in the meaning of automation, just think about automation. Hmm? Then even if it's written like here, artificial intelligence. Hmm? And, and from the panel last time, even if you are m were more oriented towards augmentation, which is good to me, at least, uh, we, I think that we came to a point we, we can answer this question. Is there a clear winner? Can we say augmentation is always, in every case, better than automation or vice versa? Yes, no. No. Your head say no. And, and the second aspect, yes, we, we cannot say that. And we are going to see that this difference is not really it doesn't need to be in this way. It doesn't need to be automation versus augmentation. It could be something different. Um, and human-centered AI advocate also this. So we, we are going to keep this separate. I, I on purpose, kept, kept this separate also to, to create the two groups that we, you didn't create because you focus more on augmentation, but yet. And the second aspect is that is strongly connected with automation augmentation but we didn't focus on this on the panels was which kind of human AI collaboration or interaction we envision hmm? uh, and the, again historically the two main points were on one side you have full human control and on the other side you have full AI autonomy hmm? and typically in automation 
what do you have? Full human control or full AI control, AI autonomy? And no human control. Yes, typically, not to mention you don't have human control because you are going to automate things. So you, you don't have involvement of, of a person hmm? or not a lot of involvement. And in augmentation instead, you have a lot of human control because you want to augment people. So people can do whatever they want and it's just supported, augmented in this, in this case. Hmm? And this is reflected also in some industry practice still nowadays. What do you think? There is a level of that on stage zero said full human control, and at level I don't remember five, six said full machine control. You mentioned this last time or two times ago. For autonomous driving. This is still present in, in industry, in practice, in standards. Levels in which you have from total human control to total technology, machine, whatever you want to call it, AI control with various level. Hmm? And, and these are again intertwined, strongly intertwined with automation and augmentation. Not always. Hmm? So in some cases you can have automation in which you have full, no human involvement at all, or you have automation in which you have some kind of involvement, but yeah, it's difficult to have full automation with full human control, and vice versa. Hmm? Could happen also for augmentation. Hmm? So, again, if you would try to, to summarize with, with a picture, um, automation versus uh, augmentation, um, I, I choose to use these uh, pictures. You, you know what, what they are, these two, both of, both of these pictures. Yes? In theory. So why, wh which one is automation? The cartoon or the movie? The cartoon. And so the other one is augmentation. Um, so clearly, this is uh, an exaggeration that you recognize. Um, and it's also clear which side of the two I would prefer, um, probably. Um, it should be uh, clear. But so why let's, let's think a little bit for this. Why uh, Iron Man is augmentation? It should be easy. Mm -hmm. Yes, at least in the first movies, he is in control and the armor does, doesn't do anything without a person in it. It's just a piece of technology put on the wall. And, but when a person is it, it augments the capability of the person. It can fly. That's not something that a person can do normally. Um, it can recognize people, the name of people, just by watching people. Uh, he can know the altitude in which he is flying, uh, can answer to the calls without using a phone. So it augments capability, performance. It is stronger with the armor than without the armor for the mechanical parts. Hmm? So clearly it's fictional, but it's still an augmentation of human performance, yet in a fictional way. Why the other one is a good example of full automation? They don't move, the technology does everything for them. So if you have watched the, the movie, the Wally, did, did you have watched the Wally? All of you? 
who is not who I'm not going to spoiler the movie who is not go okay you are not uh, I'm not going to spoil I promise uh, but in the movie at a certain point you meet humans um, and and humans appears like this the fat humans drinking and watching things on a screen and um, and in the place in which they are <laughs> is totally automatic it's totally automatized so they don't even need to um, stand up from their bed there is something that go there and they just move uh, rotating on these other things and on the seat something like the seats and the seat is moving around they don't even have to walk and if they if they need to drink then they have something to drink if they need to be entertained they have something to entertain if they need to eat they the system will provide them with eating with food so they don't need to they just need to probably to to drink and to eat and watch and speak a little bit but not too much mm. uh, so I it's clearly an exaggeration of automation it's not but still is a fully automated system that provides to every things that humans want or needs more needs than want mm. Mm. so uh, until humans until humans are aligned with the, the artificial syst intelligence system in this way with the robots uh, everything is going well when humans want to do something different it's not working because it's not in the automation part right uh, it's not what the, 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 pro the system was programmed to hmm? uh, so they, they don't have control very little control what to do because it's it's the system that uh, provide to everything and that's why they are fat and in this always in the city and also always looking at, at the screens etc mm. so again this is clearly a, a strong a strong difference but in both cases since both they are relatively recent as, as movies uh, you have artificial intelligence mm. so in Iron Man you have Jarvis that is artificial intelligence it depicted as artificial intelligence and the other one you have artificial intelligence that understand that you need to wake up and have the drink and the right amount of, of nutrients uh, drinking and eating and that you want to watch this or watch that and then you have robots that cleans things up etc so you have a lot of artificial intelligence in both cases not just in one or the other mm? it's just the goal that is changing a lot mm? but Again, let's pick this from a, a little bit more historical perspective. That's why we call it artificial intelligence versus intelligent augmentation and not automation versus augmentation. That we can call it also in the way. Because when artificial intelligence was, let's say, born in those years, more or less, 56, 1956, 1960, so in, in those years, those were, were the goal, the definition. And not by random people passing the corridor, but by Nobel laureate making some statements of important people or recognizable, recognizable people. And these are just two of the definition that say artificial intelligence was fought for automation. So John McCarthy say in 1956 that any aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence, of human intelligence, can, in principle, be so precisely, precisely described that a machine can, made, can be made to simulate it. Mm. So any aspect of learning or any feature of human intelligence can be described in a way so that a machine can replicate it exactly. So the goal is not clearly to explicitly to replace people, but just to create something that is as intelligent as people, whatever intelligence can mean or can be defined. And Herbert Simon instead, uh, nine years after, uh, make a prediction, and predictions are always bad, the forecasts are always bad in, in general in the history, and this is no exception. In 1965, uh, he said that machine will be capable 
within 20 years of doing so in 1985 we should have had machine able of doing any work that a human can do mm -hmm. and, and still we are not here we are not there mm -hmm. but again the goal when when artificial intelligence started what that was replicating the general intelligence was replicating human intelligence human all the aspects of learning of human replicating all the works that humans can do not only physical works but also cognitive works knowledge related works so writing a story mm. a and this was the, the things that started the idea that artificial intelligence was more automation and and the community especially in those years moved in that direction to replace people let's create something the goal of having the general intelligence let's create something that is fully we can in a way similar to Wally -E, we can have a machine doing all the works that people can do hmm? uh, without notice here without asking themselves should we which kind of work can we replace which kind is better not to replace hmm? and and still even if this 60 years ago more we still have some aspect of this nowadays so if you think about the example about the radiologist that we made at the beginning of the first lecture the goal there was to make radiologists obsolete to replace a radiologist with a machine that can do their work better than they do so even now in some aspects there is still this desire to replace people and with a machine even tasks like a radiologist so not moving uh, a lot of kilograms around but also cognitive work hmm? uh, that needs experience expertise and it has an impact on other people life like a radiologist in identifying a disease hmm? and and this is probably also something that brought the uh, artificial intelligence community to evolve in a way that um, the things important to measure were precision recall this kind of matrix how well it does a certain task hmm? probably that is my guess I'm not sure I cannot speak for, for everybody. And on the other side, on the same year, well, just skip the first line, that is clearly not on the same here. We have other people advocating for intelligence augmentation. And they clearly advocate for intelligence augmentation because the same uh, acronym with just the letter changed. So AI and IA. Mm. It, it's clear, it's evident that is this case. So instead of out artificial intelligence we would like to have intelligence augmentation mm? so again technology that instead of replacing human technology that augment human but still technology not other things and you see more or less in the same way so uh, Engelbart with the mouse and all the other stuff in 1962 did the entire project that involved the mouse was for augmenting the human intellect in that case not focusing on performance but just the intellect the cognitive side mm -hmm. the knowledge related side and in 1960 instead like LIDAR uh, in this uh, transactional human factor in electronics mm, uh, spoke about human computer symbiosis mm, in which computing machine will do some kind of work that is uh, routinizable to prepare the way not to replace people but to allow them to get better inside to get better decision in technical and scientific thinking so they're still focused on the cognitive aspect mostly thinking uh, more than on manual labor but there is the shift hmm, this contraposition between artificial intelligence that want to have machine able to do everything that a human can do and intelligent augmentation they say wait a moment why not having technology supporting people in doing what they are 
doing well so that it can do better things. Mm? And we have Engelbart in 62, uh, like LIDAR in 60, and, and later on, mm, in the Horvitz paper that you have read, mm, Horvitz speaks about an elegant combination of reasoning machinery and direct manipulation. Mm? Do you know what is direct manipulation? Now you know. Mm? So direct manipulation is related to HCI, is an interaction style in which user act on object typically displayed on a screen uh, by using some kind of action, physical, incremental, reversible. Those effects are immediately visible. Drag and dropping a file from a folder and another is direct manipulation because you move, physically move in a way, a file, an artifact from, from place to the other. Zooming on a smartphone screen is direct manipulation. You perform a physical gesture to, and you see a direct effect on this operation. Mm? So any kind of things that directly manipulate and you see the results immediately is in a user interface, typically graphical, is a direct manipulation. Mm? And just to put this in context, mm? and then we are going to have a break. We are speaking 1950, 1960. The Orwitz is 1999, so later on. But don't think, clearly you cannot think uh, that in those times we have the same technology that we have now. So when these people thought about those things, wrote those papers, this was the stage in which they have. So in 1930, 1930 is where is more or less defined the start of modern computer science. Mm. In 1956, so more or less when they start speaking about artificial intelligence, intelligent augmentation, for the first time at MIT, in a research lab, we had direct keyboard input to a computer. For the first time in a research lab, you have a keyboard connected to a computer. Mm? For the first time, again, in our search lab, and think that these people are more or less in those years. 56, 65, they are thinking about machine replacing people, doing all the work, and technology to do that was this. They don't even have a keyboard connected to a computer. They add a computer, but they cannot interact with the computer with a keyboard. They don't have a direct manipulation, for sure. Hmm? The, the coding ASCII was invented in 1963. Hmm? And the first computer that looked like this one in the picture, the commercial computer, was introduced in 1966 by IBM. So when they are speaking about computing, machines, technology, they experience with these are innovation for them. So in 1966, mm, all these people already said all these things, because 62, 60, and six years later, if they want to buy a computer, they can buy something like this. And this is all a computer. It's not the desk is part of the computer, you bought the entire things. And, and notice that you have a keyboard here, but and, and the rest of the computer is here. And yeah, it's connected directly, but they are not, they're not computer, personal computer like we are used to. Hmm? So just to put this in context, where these people started thinking about this thing and saying this thing, this is the world that they lived in. That was incredibly different from our world, just even for computers, for personal computers. So laptops were, not not even imaginable with this kind of technology hmm? okay let's have a 15 minutes break and then we will restart <laughs> <laughs>